Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we can get started. My name is Ron Molnar, and I want to welcome you to this session uh, on rare earths, continuing. And James Brown has kindly agreed to help me out. <laughs> so uh, on behalf of both of us, welcome to the session. Our first speaker this afternoon is John Good. And as James mentioned before the break, he is our keynote speaker, because we wouldn't be here, I don't think, without John and Niels and Mike Johnson. And so uh, it's my pleasure to, to welcome a fellow Imperial College guy. <laughs> um, John graduated as a metallurgist from the Royal School of Mines in 1963, and after four years of working in nickel and lead smelt, zinc smelters, he joined an operation in Elliott Lake, the Denison mine operation, recovering thorium, rare, ele rare earth uh, elements, and uranium. In 76, John joined Kilbourne Engineering and became responsible for several gold, uranium, base metal, and rare earth element projects, including Denison's yttrium plant, a new separation circuit at Mountain Pass, early Strange Lake studies, a Ukrainian scandium plant, and the study of five Chinese rare earth recovery separation plants. From 94 to 98, John worked for Barrick Gold in China and then returned to Canada and started consulting. Um, he, is, he has been working or has ongoing work or completed rare earth projects for us, including uh, Serra Verde, including Strange Lake, Foxtrot, Avalon, Natchalatro and Polymetals Tomtor, uh, Niobium Rare Earth Scandium project. So John has been exposed to a, many, many different projects and we rely on him very often for a perspective. And I think that's what you're gonna give us, John. Oh. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, well, as probably many of you have noticed, there are many, many uh, options being floated for the separation of rare earths. Uh, ten years ago, it was uh, solvent extraction and thousands of stages. These days, there are many other options uh, that are being um, uh, discussed. And uh, I was curious as to what these are, and uh, so I sat down and, and beavered away through all the press releases and papers and everything else to try and get uh, some kind of a handle on, on what these options are. So um, well, the overview of this presentation is a brief introduction an overall big picture review of the options. Uh, we'll look at some of the details, whoops, look at some of the details and uh, of the solvent extraction options and then of the, which seems to be a mind of its own, and then the non-SX options and some try and make some conclusions. So uh, I guess the first question is why, why does anybody want to separate these rare earths anyway? And, and the simple answer is, for those who don't know, the simple answer is that the the sort of things that come out of the, uh, the, the processing plants, the mines, have got a, a rare earth distribution like this. This is, uh, for example, Bionurbo. This is Lingnan, one of the iron exchange clay deposits. Um, I can't read that, but anyway. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Mount Weld, and this is... Uh, Sarah Verde. thank you all very much. <laughs> what wonderful eyes you've got. Where, where's your optician? Um, <laughs> So anyway, these are the distributions. You know, you've got 50% cerium, which is pretty typical, and then in this particular case, lots of yttrium or whatever, and so on. So anyway, that's the sort of stuff that comes out of the uh, mines. And what the customer wants, he wants something that's 99 to 99.39 or 49 pure. In other words, he wants something that looks like that. You've got something that looks like that. How do you get from these things to this, or from these things to this? Um, and the answer is you have to put in a separation plant. So, uh, now these separation plants are ex expensive, so uh, one question that you have to sort of start if you're developing a mine is, can you reduce the amount of effort that you're gonna put into separation? And the answer is yes, you quite possibly can. You know, you don't have to separate some of these uh, products. For example, SEG, samarium, europium, gadolinium. You can, if you don't have a lot of it, and it's not worthwhile separating at your expense, you can perhaps move that on to somebody who's already got a circuit that's doing that job and get some recompense for it. Similarly, you don't have to separate Prezio and Neo. You can sell a dididium product, which is one of the things that uh, Linus is doing. Uh, you don't have to separate all the heavies. If you've got uh, you know, a very small amount of heavies, why put in a whole bunch of mixer settlers to separate those, make a bulk product, and pass that on to somebody else who's got a heavy uh, sort of processing plant? So those are some of the ways, don't separate. Another one is to do, put in uh, early, simple separations. And 
doing this can have the cell count, so can some of these things. Uh, you can oxidize cerium in various ways such that it doesn't go into the main separation plant. Uh, you can do double salt uh, separations of lights and heavies. Uh, you can SX away uh, some of the heavies with a very simple DHPA circuit. Or you can SX lanthanum, cerium, and yttrium away from the rest of them with a naphthenic acid circuit or something else like that. So there are ways to reduce the amount of effort that you're going to do. But if you're going to do a separation, then uh, these are the options that there are uh, sort of out there at the moment. And I've highlighted in red the, the routes that are being followed routinely now. And this, this covers 95% at least of all the separation plants. So you start with a mixed rare earth product. Uh, right now, everybody's essentially doing solvent extraction. Uh, the chemistry is very simple. It's P507 or PC88A or whatever you want to call it, IonQuest 801, as the solvent. And on the mechanical side, it's, uh, it's mix of settlers. So anyway, during this discussion, we're going to look at the, these SX options, SX options, and I've broken them down into mechanical options and chemistry options, and then we'll look at the non-SX. And I've divided these into solid phase, solution phase, and pyrometallurgical ways to separate rare earths. So uh, we're going to talk first of all about uh, mechanical options for the, the process of separation using solvent extraction, basically. So there are two basic categories. One is dispersive um, options in which the phases, the two phases, the organic and the aqueous, are mixed together. And then they're, uh, in other words, dispersed, and then they're separated. And there are two ways to, to sort of, two types of equipment to use for this one. The one that everybody's using, essentially, is the mixer settler. And everybody's seen mixer settlers, and they're, they're very, very routine. Uh, some work has been done on centrifugal contactors, and, and that, that may be an option. There are some advantages to them. And these are briefly discussed here. So. Um, the, the disadvantages, if you like, of the conventional mixer settler, and one of the reasons why people go and look for alternatives, the disadvantages include um, uh, a lot of stages with typical separation factors, in other words, with PC-88A 88 -88 -88 type solvents. Um, if you're going to separate all the rare earths, you're probably going to have about 1,500 stages, individual mixer settler stages, uh, to give you a sort of a, a suite of high purity products. Um, there are, in all these mix of settlers, going to be a large solvent and rare earth inventory. And in fact, you know, it's going to take you several months to get that solvent extraction plant started up and all the, equal, and the uh, profiles established to a point where it's producing what you really want it to produce. Long response times, if something goes wrong or if the feed changes or whatever, it's going to take quite a bit of time to get that thing back together. Uh, on the other hand, these are the disadvantages disadvantages. The other hand, it, the design and the uh, sort of performance are very well established and not a problem there at all. Uh, the centrifugal contactors, they offer smaller inventories and so on, uh, but the problem with them is they're, uh, there are very few suppliers and they're not well proven at all in the long term. So that was, we were talking about the dispersive options. There are a suite of options that are non-dispersive and, and these are pretty interesting. Uh, in these, you don't mix the two uh, phases together and, and then try and separate them by gravity or centrifugal force. What you do is you, you have the two phases in contact with one another, but without dispersion. And there's a, a fair bit of work being done right now on these. Um, one that I think is going to be discussed, I don't know if Craig's here, but anyway, one that will be discussed, uh, I think, tomorrow is the microfluidics approach. And in this, you have two very fine channels, or a very fine channel, I should say. And that's, uh, can anybody read that? Ten? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll get somebody to read this. Uh, you have the organic on one side and the aqueous on the other side. And these two phases, they flow along through this channel very, very slowly, uh, without any dispersion. At the, at the end of the channel, which would be here, you just simply separate them, and, th and that's the mix of settling done, except there was no mixing. But you got the contact, and so the phase transfer took place. Um, this is all done on a very small scale, and we'll talk about it later. You, you end up with a lot of units to get uh, production to a scale. The other approach is the um, membrane approach. And um, there's an outfit called um, 
Liquicell or uh, Cellgard or whatever it is, which makes, and it started off as a Celanese company, that make these membranes. And these membranes are made of plastic, of course, and they're, it's, a, it's a very thin tube, uh, usually in the form of a, a fiber, a hollow fiber, and there's a very, the wall of this fiber has got a myriad of very, very small holes in it. So that's a one micron scale bar there, and you can see these holes are sort of in the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 microns. And what you can have in this sort of situation, you can have a, a tube made of this material with the organic flowing in the middle of the tube and the aqueous on the outside. And the contact takes place in these pores where the organic just sort of sees the aqueous. And you can get the transfer of uh, ions at that point. And there's no dispersion, so you don't have to go into a settler afterwards. So. I've talked a bit about the microfluidics already. Um, as I say, 100 micrometers by 40 mic micrometers in section, 100 millimeter long, these are the contactors. Um, to get, uh, and the flow through that, of course, is a few microliters a, an hour, if you like. So if you want to get, say, liters an hour or meter cubes an hour uh, through a device like this, what you have to do is you have to have thousands of them or millions of them, or not millions, but certainly thousands of them all working in parallel. And, um, and that is what is being looked at by uh, the guys, various guys in the industry, especially, I'd say, the Ian Warp Research Institute. There'll be a paper from them tomorrow. Um, also, University of uh, Kyushu in Japan, Kuming, University of Science and Technology. Uh, they're working on this as well. So it's a pretty interesting approach. It's got a, quite a long ways to go, I believe. But it's interesting. Membrane-supported SX, that's the, uh, the tubes with the micropores. Um, quite a lot of work being done on these. Um, so uh, we have the, uh, typically these membranes, the actual tube might be 100 to 300 micrometers. So these are very fine tubes uh, with these very fine microporous uh, walls. And the way these are built into a sort of production type unit, you might have 10,000 or 50,000 of these very fine hair-like tubes packed inside a, a shell. And you can put the organic through the tubes, through a suitable uh, manifold, and the aqueous on the outside, let's say, and, and get the contact without any dispersion. So these are uh, quite interesting. Um, there are various ways of working this. I mentioned organic on the inside and aqueous on the outside. You can have it the other way around. You can have the, the organic just in the pores and have aqueous on both sides. You can have a strip solution on one side and a loading solution on the other side and so on. So they're very versatile. And the other thing you can do is if you have the organic going one way and the aqueous going the other way, you can get multiple stages. So uh, quite a lot of work was done by, again, by Salonese, by a gentleman called Prasad a few years ago showing you know, several stages in one of these gadgets. So there's a lot of work going on. US um, Rare Earths has partnered with Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory, University of uh, Cantabria in Spain. Uh, possibly, I'm sure uh, Patrick will want to talk about this later, possibly Innovation Metals Corp are doing something like this. So we've talked about the mechanical. Uh, these are the chemistry options. and. Um, First of all, if you've got a chloride solution, which is the, the norm really, you use P507, ion crest 801, PC88A, uh, and use that as the extraction uh, agent. And that is very well established. Uh, all of the plants, almost all of the plants are using that particular solvent system, um, in, certainly in China and elsewhere. The other alternative is what Solve is using, was Rhodier, Rhone Palenque, or whatever, uh, and that is to use a nitrate system instead of chloride and TBP. Uh, that works very nicely for the light rare earths, but it doesn't work at all for the heavy rare earths, so you have to switch to uh, some other solvent to get the heavy rare earth separations. Uh, there's quite a bit of research going on looking for better uh, solvents with better beta factors, which is the separation factor between adjacent rare earths. And, um, uh, you know, that work will, I think, uh, turn out to be promising uh, at some time in the future. But uh, at the moment, uh, there's not very... There's a little bit of work has gone to fruition, and in fact, there are some circuits in China that are running with high beta uh, solvents, whereas uh, rather than PC88A, uh, but not very much at the moment. Um, 
So other options when it comes to the chemistry side of things, uh, uh, quite a lot has been done on looking for solvents that are easier to strip. And uh, I think we've got a paper on that tomorrow as well. So NX572 is, is one of those. And these claim to have uh, sort of significantly lower, uh, significantly lower uh, <laughs> uh, requirements for strip acid. Okay, we're going to have to roll along because I'm almost uh, out of time by the look of it. Um, I'll just say that, uh, meantime, you know, these are the pros and cons of these different options. Meantime, I think, um, um, you know, the, the conventional solvent extraction route is almost certainly uh, the way that one should be going. So, solid phase extraction. Um, and these are the options. First of all, there's the MRT. It's being pioneered by uh, UCOR. It is being used for this type of, uh, of extraction. It is, try, is being used for uh, platinum extraction and refining. Uh, the UCOR uh, r recently made a press release that they had from their pilot plant. They've made some 99.99% disprosium at greater than 99% recovery. So MRT, maybe it's going to go. There's not very much known about it, the durability, the cost, or anything. <coughs> this is a picture from their... Uh, from their recent press release. Uh, ion exchange, a lot of work, again, being done by uh, various people. The, the, and this, of course, was the original means of separating rare earths by, uh, in, in bulk, was by an ion exchange. The main developers of this right now are, um, are the, the um, guys at um, KTEC and Texas Rare Earths. And uh, they have recently uh, satisfied a contract they had with the US government. We'll, We'll see how that one works out. One of the issues with ion exchange is uh, you get, this is a plot of uh, purity versus the eluate. Uh, you get a lot of um, high grade material coming out of these units, but you do get a lot of mixed stuff that has to be reworked. Uh, that's KTEC. Uh, this is one that uh, sort of has popped up recently. The HPLC used to be high pressure liquid chromatography. It's now defined as high performance liquid chromatography. And, and the Norwegians and the Swedes have been doing quite a lot of work on this. And there's now a company called Retech in Norway that has recently marketed or made some f uh, six nines yttrium uh, in small quantity. And uh, this is something that might go somewhere. This is uh, a plot of uh, sort of the, the Eluit take, if you like, the Eluit cut versus the purity. And you can see some very distinct and well separated um, peaks for lanthanum serum, prezo, and so on and so on. So this is something that might, might go. And just as an aside, maybe this is what you need for, you know, a homium dysprosium separation, a very small volume separation. Uh, I'm not sure if it's ever going to go to uh, large volume uh, operations. So other uh, non-SX uh, non options is the Intelimet and bacterial. Um, we won't spend any time on that. So solution phase. So everything else has been uh, solid phase in this, where we're dealing with an extractant. Now we're talking about pure solutions, and there are a couple of options. FFE, and we have Puya and uh, Kirill are here in the room, can answer questions on these. But anyway, this is using electrophoresis to separate uh, the elements, and I think we've got a paper tomorrow on that, so that'll be interesting. Um, a lot of work's been done, and I think a lot, of, a lot more work is probably uh, required to progress this through to a production-type status. Um, these are some drawings from the, um, from the patent. The, the other one that's uh, recently, fairly recently sort of popped up is electrowinning. This was uh, first patented, just by the way. None of these are new processes, really. This was first patented in 1914, um, and this is the process that... Uh, that rare earth separations are now uh, using or about to use to separate some uh, phosphors under contract to a phosphor processor. So anyway, this is one that uh, may go somewhere. I'm not too sure. We'll have to watch, see how they work out. So the tour is over. The basic options is well-proven and understood solvent extraction technology or some of these new things that we've talked about here. Um, from my point of view, um, I've got and I'm sure everybody, including the developers, have got questions about these new processes. How good are they going to be in the long term? And, you know, if you take as an example uh, uh, microporous uh, membranes, 
uh, how long can you run stuff through these things before they, they gunk up or whatever. There are questions of that type that have to be answered. Uh, all the new processes are all sort of absolutely blank boxes when it comes to capital and operating costs, pretty well. And, uh, you know, they, that is something that has to be looked at pretty hard. Uh, very often, environmental impact, uh, reduced environmental impact is uh, claimed for these things, but uh, we have to see whether that is true or not. Um, and, and I guess, you know, if you're looking at a sole source provider of somebody's technology, you have to be cautious about that. What sort of royalties or what's the deal? And uh, are they going to be there to support it and so on and so on? So in the meantime, advanced SX, and by that I mean the sort of uh, hyperlink circuits that are being used in China and uh, looked at elsewhere, uh, that sort of advanced solvent extraction uh, process works well and is bankable. Anyway, um, I think I'm finished. So thank you very much. And any questions, I'll try to answer. Thanks, John. And I think we have time for one quick question. And perhaps people can buttonhole John during the conference for other questions. Doug? Doug. My name is Doug Plett. Uh, John, thank you for that. It's, I found it was interesting and useful presentation. Uh, with regard to soft effects, and I certainly agree with uh, uh, your conclusions uh, and, and the way the Chinese are going, it does seem to be uh, the uh, proper way to go, reducing the solvent inventory and uh, so on by the techniques that you mentioned. With regard to iron exchange, I recently attended the Iron Exchange Conference in Cambridge in uh, mm. England, and there was a session on rare earths using iron exchange. Mm. Uh, one of the uh, presenters was very much about iron exchange, but I got up and asked him, are you really suggesting that you would use iron exchange resins for individual rare earth separations? Yeah. And he said emphatically, no. <laughs> oh, yes. Wow. Individual separations, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks for that, Doug. I think the reason is, as soon as you start trying to separate them, you get these curves like this, and this, and you have to, the, the expression is rework. You have to rework maybe 50% of what you go through it. So, And that all costs more reagents. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Can, yeah, there's a lot of seats available. If people would uh, mind just quickly trying to find a seat for themselves. Um, please move into move into the middle, move into seats. There's because there's other people along coming in a, as well as well. So while uh, you're finding your seats, I will uh, introduce introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ernesto Boricaudi. Ernesto has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the Polytechnic Institute in Havana, Cuba, and he's got over 15 years of experience in the oil and minerals industry, focusing on general metallurgical process development chloride chemistry, process modeling, and design and construction of complex hydrometallurgical pilot plants for rare earth elements, lithium, titanium, um, among other metals. Um, he is now a senior metallurgist at SGS Canada, and he's going to present a paper on the uh, SGS, uh, what's it called? Uh, the commissioning of a mini REE SX pilot plant at SGS Minerals in Lakefield. Ernesto. Thank you, Don, and thank you all for being here. So as Ron said, today I'm here to talk about the commissioning of a mini rare sex pilot plant at the SES mineral facilities in the Lakeville site. So in recent years there have been a significant effort to find and develop different uh, sources of rare outside of China. Whoa. Oh, sorry. Oops. So... During those years, SES has uh, a long history of involvement in the development of different rare earth projects. Uh, as you can see in that table, uh, we have worked with deposits uh, all around the world, uh, mostly in North America, but also uh, in South America, uh, and also in and Burundi and South Africa, in Africa. Uh, during this year, we have developed some expertise in mineralogy, beneficiation, and hydrometallurgy. But we noticed that we were lacking the expertise on SX, uh, rare earth SX separation. So on that end, um, SES first funded uh, an internal R&D program 
uh, to try to develop that uh, in-house expertise on the area of the sex separation. Uh, for that, we put together a team of our own metallurgists, uh, plus we brought in some external consultants that supply the, the expertise on rare sex separation. And we also asked our on-site analytical lab to try to develop or confirm reliable methods to analyze a rare solution with purity of 99.9%. So first was to decide which separation do you want to try, because of course we won't try all of them at once. Uh, so if you look at the simplified flow sheet of a real sex separation, you start with a, an impurity-free uh, mixed real earth, either hydroxide, carbon A, or oxide. You put them in solution with uh, usually hydrochloric acid, and then you make the, the first separation uh, when you split the lights from the heavies, and then you take the lights, separate the lantern and cerium from the prasium and nodimium, and so on until you get individual elements. Um, if you take into account that most of the rare deposits are light rich, uh, where 75% of the total rare are light, and within that group, uh, lantern and cerium are close to 75% or more than three times the praseodymium and nodymium, but they have less value, it is assumed that if you have a rare deposit, you will do the first separation, the heavies from the lights, and then you will do the lanthanum and the, the lanthanum cerium separation from the praseodymium and nodymium. And, sorry, that was the reason why we chose that separation for our plant. Uh, so when we have the separation that we wanted to do, which shows the, um, the feed stream. So we took a synthetic solution, uh, we made a synthetic solution, kind of aiming to replicate the raffinate from that first separation of lights and heavy. Uh, we made it to have 150 gram per liter of total rare earth, following a typical uh, distribution. So that's like 50% cerium, then lanthanum and neodymium will be around 20%, 23% each and the rest praseodymium. And we adjust that solution pH to one using hydrochloric acid. For the organic, we choose the IonQuest A01 or P507, as John was saying, in XOL D80, around 50% volume. So once we have the feed stream and the separation, we kind of set up the flow sheet, a typical extraction flow sheet with a, sorry, typical SX flow sheet with the extraction, scrolling, Stripization. The extraction was 35 stages. Uh, there you will extract the praseodymium and neodymium, but uh, some lanthanum and cerium will get extracted too. And so for that, we go to a scrolling section, which is kind of the more important section in the circuit because it's where the split between the, the, the two groups are. You scrub the lanthanum and cerium, try to leave the most uh, neodymium and praseodymium there in the organic that goes to a strip. Uh, section and it's where you get the final PR and D probe and the lantern and cerium probe goes out in the raffinate from the extraction circuit. Uh, so after that we went on to build uh, our SX plant. Um, as you can see, well you cannot see it, but there are 120 cells in that plant. Uh, it's built in two 60 cell molds that can hold any it can hold different configurations and you can try different systems there. Uh, as you can see, the cells were fairly small. For perspective, this is a quarter inch line. So the mixer was around 100 mils and the settler was around 300 mils. The point here is uh, we know that feed availability for these products is a problem and uh, also from the rare earth ore to produce a solution that is ready to feed into this plant is a process that is very expensive. So the smaller the plant, uh, it allows you to run the longer with a limited amount of sample. And that was the main reason why we did it uh, at that size. So after the plant was built, um, we ran a commissioning campaign, basically just to look at the physical operation of the plant. Uh, we ran it for five days and all the key, all the key equipment uh, function very well. Uh, the analytical lab, the R on site analytical lab, uh, gave us very quick turnarounds. Uh, you can see the times there. 
And even though we were looking at the chemistry, we were able to reach a raffinate or lanthanocerium pro with 98.9% purity and a praseodymium neodymium pro with 99.2% purity. So after that, we went to the actual campaign where we really wanted to focus on the chemistry. <laughs> So our goal was to produce and sustain 3.9 purity in the strip liquor and produce and sustain 99% uh, purity in the raffinate. We run for 20 to 21 days. And so the sequel ran for 474 hours continuously with only 2.4 hours of downtime. <coughs> we were able to process 150 liter of fish solution uh, producing 240 liters of, of raffinate of the lantern and serum product and 100 liters of uh, the neodymium and praseodymium product. Just a quick note here, uh, with only 150 liters of solution, as I said, because of the plant was so small, we were able to run 20 days, which uh, it's a time long enough to kind of get to a steady state and make some changes mm -hmm. if you want to. The sampling procedure, because the plant is so the plant is so small, we noticed that when you take some samples, that could create some uh, instability on the plant. So we were able to optimize these sampling procedures uh, and try to minimize the effect of the sampling in the sequence stability. And again, the, our on-site analytical lab were able to give us really quick turnaround times, one hour for echo solution, 24 for organics. We also use a portable XRF uh, that we didn't use for the actual result, but just to follow trends. You know, if you want to see if the neodymium is going up or down in the organic, you take a quick sample, put it in the XRF, and then you can take that sample back in the sequel. It doesn't cause any instability, and it's, uh, it's very good just to help you control the operation. So looking at the specific circuits, so in the extraction, we were able to keep the lantern of extraction below 10%, Serum extraction was around 50% for most of the campaign, and the praseodymium and neodymium extraction were over 99% for most of the campaign. Uh, one of the goals that we had was to produce a raffinate uh, with a purity of over 99%. I were able to do that uh, for more than 300 hours of operation. Uh, here it's a, it's, it's a profile sampling. Uh, the left side is a echo solution. Uh, this is the gram per liter of rare earth, and here is the stages from 1 to 35 in the extraction sequence. The one in the right is the load organic, and the same idea with the stages. So you can see how the, when in the sequence each meta was uh, load and when it was being pushed off. So for example, as you can see, the serum is the first one to load, or at the beginning of the sequence, and then the concentration in the organic goes down because praseodymium and neodymium have been load and kind of push serum off. Uh, overall, we were able to get around 30 grams per liter of total rare earth in the organic, which theoretically is around 90% of the available capacity that, that we had. Um, if we go to scrolling, <coughs> sorry, scrolling, uh, we scrub all the, the, the lantern from the load organic. The serum scrolling was around 90%, are we talking more? I will talk more about that in the stripping section, why it wasn't 100 there. And the praseodymium scrolling was too aggressive at times. We noticed that uh, we, have been, we, we were scrolling too much praseodymium. And we were able to keep the neodymium scrolling at 2%. So if you look at the similar graph, again, aqueous on the left, organic on the right, and the stages at the bottom, you can see how the low organic was around five to six gram per liter, but throughout the sequel was coming down and it was up to two to three gram per liter at the end of the scrolling section. You can see even the neodymium taking a hit here at the last stage. Basically, it seems that we had too much acid in the scrub feed. Uh, you can see how the cerium goes down, but then kind of reach a plateau there and it's not being scrubbed anymore. Um, if we look at the stripping, uh, praseodymium and neodymium stripping was 100%. We couldn't, we, we noticed some cerium build up in the organic, uh, around two to three grams per liter of cerium was left in the strip organic. We think that this is cerium 
uh, in the form of cerium-4 that came from the, from the reagents that we used to make up the synthetic solution. And if we use real feed, you shouldn't have this problem. However, you should always be looking at the at your cerium in the organic and, and see if there is any accumulation. And if there is one, you have to find a way of, of dealing with that. But most important, this building up of cerium did not affect the purity of the strip liquor, which was 99% uh, uh, purity for more than 290 hours and over 99.9% for more than 160 hours. So the main conclusions, a uh, successful commissioning operation of the rare the sex separation plant at the facilities in SES Lakefield was accomplished. Uh, the sex pilot plant is very robust and have a flexible setup that you can use for different configurations. The operation of the two campaigns led to a development of a fully trained crew of SES, SX operators, metallurgists, and chemists. Uh, the presence on the on-site analytical lab proved invaluable to its ability to quickly deliver reliable, accurate, and precise aqueous and organic assays, which uh, help us to control and operate the plant. And overall, the SX campaign produced a neodymium praseodymium pro with over 99.9% .9 purity and a lanternum cerium pro with over 99% purity, with overall recoveries of 97% praseodymium, 100% for neodymium, and close to zero for lanternum and cerium. Uh, so the authors of this paper would like to thank John Wood, uh, Michael Neese, and Jerry Taylor for their support and expertise uh, during this time. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Ernesto. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, I think. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Doug, you had the last. No, you had one before. Somebody. Very quick question. <laughs> yes. Uh, how long did it take to achieve uh, steady state uh, operation? You didn't mention that. Uh, I think it took us around a hundred hours. About a hundred hours. In yes. Yeah. We we never kind of totally reached steady state. I mean, we we were. <laughs> But we got to a point we, that we got to a point that way it was stable. It was and stable then, and controllable. And then we start making changes. And yeah, then. yeah. So I mean, we were still optimizing, but it, it yes. It, it, because I think because of the quick uh, assay turnaround and because of the XRF, we were able to see where things were going, so we could head head things off at the pass before uh, before they got out of control completely. So that that was very helpful. Somebody else? Yes, please. Yes, it's because yes. they. Yeah, I can show you here. You can see that the. Crop liquor is returned to the extraction, so that's why the raffinate is bigger than the feed because the scrub liquor is back to reactor. So there was 150 liter of feed, but we produced 240 because the scrub feed went up to the raffinate too. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Uh, no, I mean for the uh, scrubbing acid. Close to your body, your last, your feet, right? Because the two combine together that the right? Your rear speed and the, the washing acid, the two speed combine to the left right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So what the, the, the feed fluoride for the acid, washing acid? For this one here? Yeah. All the resource compared to it was about 70, 40, 70, 30. Yeah, you can see the oil ratio here. It was 2.5 in the extraction and 10 to 1 in the, in the scrolling. Okay, that makes sense. So you can, say, you can see a ratio there. Okay. Go ahead, yeah. For the oil recovery, for the PR and the MD, you mentioned the PR extracted uh, 97%? What? Well, that's... 100%? So the oil recovery more than 97%? 
Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if I understood, but anyway, the neodymium is 100% because throughout the campaign, we were able to extract 100% of neodymium and then strip it. The praseodymium, it had some ups, ups and downs, and that's why it's 97% and not 100%. That's like the overall recovery, counting the ups and downs. In close to steady state uh, situation, then it would be 100% praseodymium and 100% neodymium. Yeah. Yeah. Darcy? Uh, just a quick question with regards to the cerium on the scrubbing mechanic. Yes. You're saying that you're getting 99.9% NDPR in the strip. Are you using the cerium not stripping off for some reason? No. No. I, I think I mentioned that the. So if I show you here. So this is a scrub section, but. Just to give you an idea, you can see how we are stripping up to this point and then it kind of flat out and around two to three grams per liter. We saw the same in the in the stripping. Like there was no stripping. That's why I say that it doesn't affect the purity because it didn't strip. Uh, so it just went around, basically. It would eventually poison the organic. Well, yes. It started to build up because this is a small plant. We, what we did at some point was take some of the organic inventory out and put fresh organic in. Yeah. Uh, you know, in 15 minutes of presentation, you have so much to say. Yes. Um, I think we better move on, so thank you, Ernesto. Our next speaker is Dr. Abdul Halim, who has been working as a senior process hydrometallurgist at Process Research Ortec in Mississauga, Ontario, since 2011. He graduated from the Department of Chemistry at the University of Chittagong in Bangladesh and obtained his PhD in environmental system engineering from Kyushu University in Japan in 2006. Dr. Halim has over 10 years of experience in hydrometallurgical process development minerals processing and wastewater treatment. He has published over 50 scientific papers in different journals and international conference proceedings and has six patents and three book chapters to his credit. Dr. Halim has received several awards, including the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, um, postdoctoral fellowship research, uh, research fellowship from the National University of Singapore, and an IRD NSERC fellowship of, in Canada. Dr. Halim. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you. I can't read it from here, but you can read it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the integrated process for separation and purification on rare earth in mixed chloride media. I would like to take that opportunity to thank our uh, co-authors, uh, some of them present in here, before I start this one. So my presentation will be uh, divided it, uh, into mainly the two uh, sections. So the first part will be that uh, bulk recovery of rare earth from the ores in mixed chloride media. And then second part will be that individual separation by solvent extraction process steps. So as you know that uh, the rare earth mainly the uh, lanthanum to lutetium and yttrium. I'm going to talk about the introduction. So the use of this rare earth in modern uh, electronic materials is increasing consistently. And everybody knows that more than 95% or more 90% supply uh, by China, and the demand for the rare earth increasing rest of the world. So for the demand for the rest of the world to develop the new process is also in, uh, are pushing us. So we use, and we develop a patented process for mixed uh, rare earth uh, in mixed chloride media. In that system, so we use hydrochloric acid and magnesium chloride. So if you use the magnesium chloride, so then you can avoid that hydrochloric acid consumption. So if you see that figures how the magnesium chloride enhancing the hydrogen ion activity in the solution, the hydrochloric acid solution at different temperatures. So, so this technology we also use for uh, several other ores, uh, such as lactride ores, sulfide ores, and ilmenite ores to recover the value of us from these materials. I'll move to that, uh, some results 
using this mixed chloride media to recover the rare earth from that, uh, either from uh, ore or concentrate. So it was conducted uh, per uh, atmospheric pressure at 95 degree temperature under these conditions. The recovery of, leasing recovery of rare earth was uh, 90, 86%, so by including HGM it is going down a little bit at uh, 83%. So after the solid liquid separation, pregnant lease solution was uh, undergoes uh, for selective recovery of iron by solvent extraction process steps. In mixed current media, so it is a, a one advantage is that, so under the oxidizing condition, iron will form as a ferric chloride. Uh, depending on the hydrochloric acid concentration, it may form high H plus FeCl4 minus. Using this uh, species, so you can selectively extract the iron from the pregnant list solution over the other metals. The raffinate of the iron, uh, goes to impurities removal uh, by, again, solvent extraction process steps. By manipulating that the organic phase, you can extract the uh, copper, zinc, and uranium if they present into the solutions. Followed by, in our cases, there is a, a significant amount of zirconium we were extracting, extracted zirconium by solvent extraction using that uh, PC-88. The refinite goes to a direct precipitation of rare earth so using oxalic acid at PS2. So about more than, about 98% rare earth was precipitated at room temperature. The other portion, we also uh, checked that the solvent extraction to extract the rare earth from that uh, um, zirconium, acid extracted zirconium refinite by pc 88 So it shows that around 99% rare earth was extracted from the acid extracted zirconium refinite. So this is the overall uh, flow sheet in the first part. So main step was the atmospheric leasing of rare earth from the ore materials or concentrated in mixed chloride media. After that, the uh, pregnant list solution undergoes the iron solvent extraction, followed by strip the iron with a dilute hydrochloric acid. Here we check the pyrohydrolysis. Nowadays, the different process also available. You can uh, recover the hydrochloric acid and recycle to the leasing esters. It will also produce high value iron oxide. The refinite goes to impurities removal, followed by zirconium solvent extraction. If the free acid is uh, higher, so sorry, free, in that case, the free acid was also extracted with tertiary amine. And then the refinate of the zirconium ref, sorry, refinate of the zirconium goes to two, two ways, so direct precipitation of rare earth with oxalic acid, and the other part, the solvent extraction followed by stripping in hydrochloric acid. The one advantage is that hydrochloric acid containing rare earth solution can be used directly in the, into the individual separation. So I'll move to the pilot plan operation for individual rare earth separation. In that particular cases, we have used rare earth oxide to dissolve the rare earth into the concentrated hydrochloric acid solution. So there are some impurities such as aluminum and iron. As you know, we can remove that aluminum iron by adjusting the pH. The pH of the feed solution before moved to the solvent extraction process step, so we adjust it with sodium hydroxide. This is the typical uh, composition of the feed solution in order to conduct the solvent extraction. So pilot plan operation inputs or parameters were determined using the model developed by SciTech Industry Inc. for Cyanex 572. So actually these uh, parameters were fitted into the solvent extraction process steps. The first solvent extraction circuit was conducted for selective separation of samarium to lutetium plus yttrium over lanthanum to neodymium with 50% uh, cyanex, sorry, cyanex 572 in kerosene that was saponified with sodium hydroxide. The loaded organics goes to a scarving of uh, some co-extracted lighter rare earth followed by stripping with hydrochloric acid. 
The SX-01 was conducted continuously 3,484 hours over the six months. The purity of refinate and stiff liquor was 99.8 and 99.9 percent, .9 respectively. If you see that the figures, uh, it will show the distribution of rare earths into organic phase at different section, extraction, scrubbing, and stripping. The heavier rare earths remain same during the scrubbing, while the stripping kinetics of uh, YB and lutetium is slower than the other rare earths. This is the uh, results of uh, refinite and strip solution of fast solvent extraction process steps. And there is a partial uh, photograph of solvent extraction circuit one, that is the extraction stage. After completion of the uh, solvent extraction circuit one, so we move to uh, SX2 to selectively extract SO2 LU plus uh, HEM over samarium to dysphosium with again saponified 50% cyanx 527 in kerosene. And there was some other impurities was co-extracted, not impurities, that is the rare earth, uh, mainly the dysphosium that was uh, scrapped, followed by a strip with hydrochloric acid solution. And this circuit was continued for 5,352 hours. The purity of refinate and strip liquor was 98% and 99% respectively. So the table shows that the rare earth concentration in the refinate and strip solution of SX2, and then if you see that the distribution of the heavier rare earth in the organic phase are different uh, extraction, scrubbing, and stripping states in these figures. After complexion that uh, SX3, we moved to SX, sorry, SX2, we moved to SX3 to uh, selective extraction of dysphosium, tarbium to dysphosium over samarium to gadolinium. So tarbium and dysphosium are selectively extracted over samarium to uh, ZD from uh, the refinate of SX2 with, again, cyanx 572 in kerosene that was saponified with sodium hydroxide. Uh, followed by the loaded organic conducted with the hydrochloric acid to scrub the ZD, followed by the stripping of niobium and tarbium from the organic phase with orga hydrochloric acid. And this circuit was continued for uh, 1,515 hours over three months. The purity of the refinate and strip liquor was 98.5% and 98%. Well, this is the concentration of rare earth in the refinate and strip uh, solution of SX3. And figure shows that uh, the distribution of this rare earth in the extraction is carving and stiff solution. So mainly the ZD was co-extracted with the tarbium and dysphosium, and that was scrubbed with hydrochloric acid uh, prior to stripping of this tarbium and dysphosium. The stiff liquor was conducted with the saponified cyanx-572 to extract both of these metals, followed by a scrub that tarbium and then strip the dysphosium with hydrochloric acid. This SX4 was continued for 1,668 hours over the three months. And this is the typical uh, uh, distribution of the rare earth in the raffinate and strip solution. This is a very simplified flow sheet. As I mentioned that the concentrate that is the rare earth oxide was dissolved in concentrated hydrochloric acid solution followed by a solid liquid separation. Actually, mainly it, it was dissolved. And then pregnant list solution goes to SX1 prior to extraction of the samarium to lutetium and HCM of lanthanum to neodymium. That loaded organic was scrapped followed by stripped these metals, and the refinate contain the lighter rare earths. Then the SX2, ASO2LU plus yttrium was extracted over samarium to dysphosium. And then again, we scrap followed by strip. And the strip solution was separately uh, stored. And the refinate was 
conducted the another cyanex 572 that was saponified with the sodium hydroxide to uh, separate terbium to disposium over samarium to gadolinium. And then it's stripped with hydrochloric acid. Again, that in solvent extraction stage four, terbium and disposium was co-extracted, or both were extracted to the loaded organic phase, followed by scrub the terbium, and then strip the disposium. So I'm um, come up with the uh, conclusion. So as I mentioned in the first part, we use magnesium chloride in hydrochloric acid. That help us to enhance the hydrogen ion activity into the uh, lixivians. And then thereby increase the uh, rare earth extraction with the lower concentration of HCl. So we use solvent extraction that eliminate the neutralization reasons for extraction and rare earth precipitation. And minimize, it also minimize the foreign ion. We're not using any sodium hydroxide to neutralize that or other caustic. So that minimize the foreign ion in the system, they reduce the impurities removal cost in subsequent process steps. And if you see that the first uh, for flow sheet, so 70 or 80 percent a refinite was recycled to the leasing states. So refinite mainly contained the magnesium chloride and hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid also regenerated from the ferric chloride solution. And that are also recycled to the leasing states. So we conclude that this process has a simplified flow sheet that is closed loop and thus environmentally friendly. In the pilot flame sections, we successfully conducted to separate actually the heavier rare earth from the lighter rare earth, and by further separation of heavier rare earth. The purity of the refinite was 98%, sorry, 99.8%, 98.9%, and 98.5% for SX1, SX2, and SX3, while the purity of that strip solution was 99.9, 99.5, .9, and 98% for this. SX processes steps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Anyone have any questions for our speaker? Go ahead. My name is Kevin Lyon from Idaho National Lab. Um, I'm just curious, do your SX does each individual circuit utilize a reflux or recycle of the strip layer for the strip section? Okay, so I have uh, some of the colleagues, uh, they're also very uh, famous and they run actually the pilot plan. One of the owner, another is the, our manager, he can explain. And so, hi, Darcy. Uh, <laughs> so, when we ran the circuits, we actually didn't use the strip solution back in the scrubbing. We actually just used the, the bearing acid to lightly strip, basically almost selectively strip the elements off. So, you did get an increase target of it in that solution, but then it would be crowded back on to the end throughout the scrubbing stage. So that would slow keep it as we have on the machine. John, you have a Okay, continue please. You John. Please, please, please. <laughs> please. I'm, not, I'm not too sure uh, what the objective of the test work was, but uh, you know in terms of the purity of the product, uh, you're probably a little bit short of what commercial products normally are, are aiming at. So I, I guess the first question is, um, did, did you have enough stages in the, in the circuit, or should you have had a few more? Um, and, the, and the other question, which I, if I can, I'll ask as well at the same time, is, uh, you know, you must have been running for over a year, and I, and I guess the question is, uh, why? Okay, you see that the, this is the uh, uh, actual target was that heavier rare separation is not easy, it's very difficult, There's the separation factor is very low, yeah. okay? So we done for uh, over the year, yes, yeah. so we learned a lot of things, so a lot of things happened, so we uh, solved the problem and again go forward. So it, it might be clear, can clear uh, Patrick on. Yeah, what, when you're doing, especially with heavy rare separation, it takes... You know, a normal plant would be 1,300 mix or seven stages. So, you know, we, we couldn't go out and afford to build, you know, 1,300 of these things. It was a USDOD funded project. We had a limited budget, so we basically had 130 mix or seven stages. And we 
we chose 130 because it represented the largest number of stages that we had in any of the 16 different circuits. So that, and then partially you're answering your question about, uh, about purity and things like that. We literally had to run you know, a circuit that might take months to reach equilibrium. Of course, somebody asked me a question about equilibrium before. Yeah, it, it did take months, and that's, a lot of people don't realize that you take that long. And then we had to run it for a longer time. And then we'd have to actually rinse and wash the whole thing. And you can never rinse and wash it until you leave. And we did this with all the circuits. So you can imagine, we actually had this thing running for over 18 months. Yeah. Uh, also, I guess for SX3 and 4 as well, they were essentially raising the purity controller on both sides. Because in SX2, if you look back at the, the rafting data, there was a little bit of homium in nutrient okay. that ended up in our feed solution, which was what feeds SX3 and SX4. And you can't separate it unless you actually build another circuit or train the circuit for another how many months to get that 70 ppm ppm out because it, it just carries on through all the way We had a certain amount of time so even though by the time you reach equilibrium all the product that you were saving for your next circuit it's going to have a little bit of impurity there so unless you want to run it for that much longer to produce enough feed for the next circuit which we didn't have that time we have to live with that impurity but we at least we can explain that just a small comment, it's not like we're ever in steady state. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, Any questions? So you also uh, ask go ahead. Question. Yeah, may I ask uh, okay. one question for the uh, separation coefficient, the group separation between carbonium and uh, turbine? How many states do you use for the separation? Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry uh, we cannot answer that one due to some. <laughs> so still, it is in process. Secret, huh? Thank you. <laughs> I have just one small question. Was all the feed that you used coming from leaching ore, or was some of it from some making up from chemicals? Okay, so this is the concentrate we use for uh, the pilot plan. Right. So it is coming from the one place, or different, right? Came from a couple of places. Yeah, a couple. Of places. Okay, but I mean, you, you leached concentrate, yeah, or or you bought oxides and, and dissolved them like we did. Yeah, in oxide SGS. dissolved in hydrochloric acid. Or you actually bought oxides and dissolved them. It so a, you, it was a concentrate. It was a concentrate made by somebody else. Right. Yeah. So it was ninety-five, I guess, ninety-five percent. More than ninety-five percent. So that's where the iron and the aluminum impurities okay. come from. Okay. So it wasn't just like we bought oxides. And no. no, 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 they're not. Somebody else dissolved yeah, them. Some Bought them and dissolved them. <laughs> they mentioned it is the, yeah, the uh, rare trioxide. So, but the purity is more than 90. Right, right, okay. Because I'm just wondering if you have ran long enough to make all that leech feed oh, no. to generate all the feed for this six months of running. No. Yeah. Um, w thank you very much. Thank Abdul you.